non-profit cooperative created and supported by the cable television industry as a public service to its national cable television audience. In addition, C-SPAN is underwritten in part by the following. There's so much to be done in America. We can do it by giving five. Five percent of our income, five hours a week to charity. Gannett Foundation supports Give Five. It's all of us doing our part. AFSME, the Public Employee Union, representing more than a million public employees in states, cities, and towns across the country, fighting for emerging issues like child care, parental leave, and workplace health and safety. AFSME, in the public service. In the name of the Almighty God, the most merciful and the most beneficent, and may God's blessing be upon his final messenger and prophet Muhammad, and upon the rest of the prophets of God. We continue our second day of our conference with session three which will be dealing with politics and contemporary social issues, developing an Islamic approach. And we are honored by having one of the social workers in the nation, Mr. Mitch Schneider, who accepted our invitation to inaugurate this session. Mitch. Is that a ribbon? <laughs> Good morning. Well, I appreciate the invitation to join you, and I appreciate the presence of those of you who are here, and I wonder why there's so few of you here. And I think it would be good if there were more, and there should be, there needs to be. Um, I think I was invited to join you, aside from your own interest, or those who have put this together, interest in my being here, because uh, some of us are now involved in attempting to bring large numbers of people to Washington in October to convince the federal government to begin to put money once again into affordable housing, because there is little money in affordable housing at the federal level, and because of that, millions of people are living on the streets, and tens of millions of others are finding it increasingly difficult to find a decent place to live. And so on October 7th, there will be hundreds of thousands of people coming to Washington to convince Congress that it must find the money to replace the nearly 80% of the housing budget that has disappeared since 1981. And so that is my interest in being here, just to let you know that that's going to be happening and to invite you to support that in whatever ways you can. I was talking to someone outside a little while ago who asked me what kind of response we have gotten from various communities. He asked me what kind of response we've gotten from Muslim communities in terms of the struggle to help people who are homeless find a place to live and to create affordable housing sufficient to meet the needs of at least our people. And uh, I told him that with the exception of a few people like Jim Zogby, very few connections had been made, and that I understood that, at least in part, that's attributable to the fact that you are, for the most part, an immigrant community. And traditionally, in this country, immigrant communities did not make waves and did not address difficult social issues. And you, of course, have the added situation of being a 
deeply resented and oppressed in the sense that a large number of people in this country are not enamored of the Islamic or the Arab community in this country, and we all know why. Um, we also concluded that in spite of that, justice demands that when injustice is being perpetrated and is reigning that people of conscience and people who claim to be people of faith have to stand up and speak out regardless of the cost or the consequence. And so I would encourage you to constantly bear that in mind. There is a housing crisis in this country. It is not a mystery. It exists because since 1981, nearly 80% of the housing budget has disappeared. It's been cut, as have other programs that provide services and resources to people in this country who need assistance. Not all of them by any means poor. Many moderate income, many elderly and disabled on fixed income, increasingly middle income people, and whether that's housing or health care or daycare or assistance to older people or children or disabled people, the massive cuts that have taken place over the last eight years have done tremendous damage. And it isn't just housing or human services that have been damaged and that have been cut. Over the last eight years, there has been a dramatic shift in the priorities and in the agenda of this nation, away from compassion, away from the legitimate needs of people, in the direction of increased militarism, in the direction of increased wealth and power. And so over the last eight years, a very small circle of people who exercise tremendous power and have tremendous wealth have essentially rewritten the agenda of the nation, and they have moved all of those resources from the side of the ledger that says housing and health care and daycare and all those other things to the side that says the Pentagon, major corporations, and exceedingly wealthy individuals. In addition to doing that, and in addition to doing great damage to the economy of this nation, in the last eight years, that small circle of people, without meaning to do it, because they're not evil. I've never met an evil person. If people were evil, it would be easy. We would simply eliminate the evil people, and then the world would be a just and equitable place. But it doesn't work like that. They're profoundly ignorant people, those people that now run and govern our nation, they have little understanding of what it means to be anything near the average American. Their experiences and their conditions don't allow them to understand that, and so they're faithful to their own perceptions, and they're faithful to their own understanding. And in addition to ruining the economy in the process, they have also torn apart the fabric of the society. We are now the murder capital of the world, and in this city, which is the capital of the Western world. We are now the murder capital of the Western world. There's a half a million automatic weapons floating around this country today, many of them in the hands of young children. I know very young children that walk around with machine guns under their jackets. There are now drugs in every corner of this nation, and this country is more drugged out than any nation has ever been in the history of humankind. That is just a few examples of what has been done, what has happened to this culture in just eight years of priorities and programs based on greed and selfishness and an absolute lack of compassion, and we can't stand another four or eight years of that. This nation can't, the culture can't, the American people can't, and because of our great wealth and power and great reach, the world can't, because we have the ability to affect the quality of life throughout many parts of the world, and we do that increasingly negatively. And so we will be coming, many of us, to Washington in October to try and rearrange the priorities and the agenda of the nation somewhat, to try and convince Congress that the need for affordable housing is no less severe than the need to bail out the SNLs, that if they can find 150 or 160 billion dollars to bail out those SNLs that have wound up in a financial crisis, primarily through fraud and mismanagement that Congress can put back the $25 billion a year that it cut from housing, and that in cutting from housing has created this massive crisis in the country. Millions and millions of people now have no place to live, and Congress has been told that within 15 years there will be at least 19 million people in this country who have no place to live. 
if Congress simply does what it's doing now, no more and no less. But that is what we refer to as the programmatic side of it. You know, if we want to solve the housing crisis, we put more money into housing, we take it from somewhere else, we shift our priorities a little bit, and we build housing. That's easy to deal with. It's easy compared to the systemic ills that confront this society. Not easy because there's a great deal of opposition politically to spending money on housing or health care or daycare and it's very effective opposition which is why 80 percent of the housing budget has disappeared at the same time as a nearly 100 percent increase in defense spending has occurred. But solving that problem is easy in comparison to the real problems that confront us as a nation. Back in 1980, I spent four months living on the streets of this city. I took up residence on a heat grate, a four by four foot piece of steel in downtown Washington in the winter, from the first day of winter to the last day of winter. And I sat on that grate and it provided a, a window on reality for me. You get a very different view of the world when you sit on a four by four foot piece of steel watching thousands of people walk by and either not see you or look at you and not see you as a human being. And during the course of those four months, occasionally late at night, I would leave that heat grate on which I slept and I would walk to what was then the only public restroom available in Washington at night, one by the Washington Monument. They have since closed it because it was being used. Which means now that thousands and thousands of people who live on the streets of Washington because the shelters are all full and they can't come inside are forced to violate the law every night because it is illegal to defecate and urinate in public. But back then, this one bathroom by the Washington Monument was open. And occasionally, late at night, I would go there and I would find an amazing sight. Inside that bathroom, there would be dozens and dozens of people. Every stall would be filled with someone sitting up, sleeping. People would line the walls. People would be curled up on the floor. It was a disgusting sight. It wasn't the people that were disgusting. What was disgusting was that within sight of the Capitol, within sight of the White House, within just a few feet of the Washington Monument, the symbol of this nation's power and greatness and wealth, dozens of people whose only common bond was that they were temporarily or permanently disabled in some way and desperately and legitimately in need of help were reduced to living in a bathroom and eating out of trash bins. And there are millions of people like that across this country. And I would walk out of that bathroom and I would look at that monument and I would realize that the most difficult part of all of what I was looking at was the deep contrast, the contradiction. The fact that within feet of that monument, those people suffered in misery and in abject poverty in a country that has more wealth than the earth has ever seen before, concentrated in any set of hands. You could take Rome and Greece at their height and put them together and they were paupers compared to this country. A country that's less than 5% of the world's population and controls more than 50% of the world's wealth. In looking at that scene, it's fairly easy to understand that something is desperately wrong. And there are many people in this country who spend considerable amounts of time and energy discussing and discerning the root causes of poverty and injustice. But what most people refer to as roots are in fact only the branches. You see, the truth is that the existence of millions of people at our feet in this country and the other manifestations of violence and injustice throughout this nation and the world, such as the fact that every minute 45 people die of starvation or deaths related to starvation, most of them children under five, the fact that enormous quantities of resource and wealth go into the production of instruments of destruction and war to the point where there's little left to guarantee food and clothing and housing and education. The fact that we are methodically destroying the ecology, which means the very land, air and water on which we rely for our continued existence. None of those things are temporary aberrations. Not as though if we had a few more Ralph Nader's and made a few adjustments here and a few adjustments there, everything would be okay. It will not be okay. The truth is, whether we like to acknowledge it or not, is that those things, those 
acts of violence. And that injustice is the logical, predictable, and inexorable consequence of our efforts as a society to build a culture on greed and individualism and competition. And I said that not long ago to a group of people in Detroit and somebody leapt up and said, aha, you're a communist. And I said, no, I'm a Christian. And why can't you tell the difference between the two? Because there is no faith on this earth that I'm familiar with that does not demand that our brothers and sisters be treated as our brothers and sisters and have access to the resources that they need to live. And so we build a country on greed and we consume more as others consume less. And we watch those around us eat out of garbage pails and live and die on the streets. And we go about our business as though they were in some way separate and apart from us. They're not. The truth is that there is a God. The truth is that it is a just and loving God. And because of the existence of that just and loving God, it is an absolute truth that all human beings are sisters and brothers to one another. And that every one of us is equal members of one family. And that the human community is but a very small part of a very large and beautiful and coherent creation. And anything that denies or disrupts that unity is wrong. and needs to be rooted out, resisted, and overcome. And you can take that out of the abstract very quickly. Anyone in this room that has two pairs of shoes is a thief because there are people walking around this city with no shoes. Anyone who has more food than they need to get through the next 24 to 48 hours is taking food out of the mouths of people who have none. There is a direct connection, and just because we don't see it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. And so, ultimately, if we want to overcome those evils and those injustices, we have to do a couple of things. We have to reduce the distance between ourselves and those people who suffer and die on the streets and throughout the world who suffer and die for no good reason because it is a wealthy, beautiful world that can more than adequately meet the needs of all of its people. We need to live as though the person on the street is our neighbor. We need to stand up and say no when it's appropriate. We need to speak out regardless of cost or consequence because when we don't stand up and speak out, and when we don't act as though that person is our sister and brother, and when we don't address the injustice and the evil that surrounds us, we become part of it. And the cost that we pay is far higher than the cost that's exacted of any of those other human beings. And so it seems to me that we have to respond proportionately to the pain and the suffering that surrounds us, and we have to uh, we have to understand how change occurs. And we have to understand what it means to do our share. And that, for me, is the ultimate question. The only question that I find interesting enough to address on a constant basis. And that is, what does it mean for me to do my share as a human being, as a person of faith, in the face of millions of human beings eating out of garbage pails and living and dying on the streets? And that's not an answer that I can provide to anyone else. There's no one that can provide an answer for others. The truth is that just as theologians say, all the way to heaven is heaven, the struggle to discern what it means to be a decent, caring, faithful human being is what each of us is called on to undertake. And we have to discern and divine the answers for ourselves. But in closing, one thing I can share with you, and that is a personal experience that I have found helpful in better understanding what it means for me to do my share in the face of all of that pain and misery and injustice and violence. I live in a shelter in downtown Washington. Now it's a very nice place to live. We've convinced the government to spend $14 million fixing it up. It's the largest, most comprehensive facility in this country. And about two or three years ago, it was not. It was a dirty, filthy, rotten place to be. There were holes in the wall so large that you could walk in without ever using a door. Virtually every window was either broken or the window frames themselves were missing. There were two toilets for more than a thousand people in that building. And so the older people and the disabled people who couldn't, couldn't dream of making it to the part of the building that the bathroom was in would simply urinate and defecate all over the building. And so the building looked and felt like and smelled like a sewer. 
And yet every night a thousand or more people would squeeze into that building because the alternative was so much worse. And I would stand on the front steps of that, that shelter in the evening occasionally and I would watch as all of these people come in. I would watch the disabled people, people with no legs, people blind. I would watch the people who are mentally disabled, little old folks carrying plastic bags, obviously mentally disabled, staring vacantly into space. I would watch the children who had neither parents nor any place to live come in and out of that building. And I would stand and I would watch and I would be speechless because there's really nothing you can say in the face of that. But inside, every night I stood there, I would be raging. And every night it would be the same monologue. I would say, God, look at this. Look at these innocent people. What did they ever do to deserve this? You can't let this go on. It's wrong. Do whatever you have to do to make it better. Change it. Because these people do not deserve to be living like this. It is not right. Stop anything else that you're concentrating on and deal with this. And then one night, one evening, I came to understand. And what I came to understand was that it was and is in the existence of all of those people pouring into that building and the millions of others like them throughout this country and the hundreds of millions of others worse off than them throughout this world, in the existence of all of those people, God is, was, saying to me exactly what I was saying to God, which is, Mitch, look at all these innocent people. These are your sisters and brothers. This is your mother and father. These are your children. These are you. Stop anything and everything that you're doing. Do anything and everything that you must to make it better, because it is wrong, and I didn't create it. You did. And so no matter what you're doing, make sure that you find the time and the energy and the resources to make sure that this doesn't go on anymore. That's what I came to understand. And what I would leave you with is what members of my community leave people with anywhere we go. And that is a request. In fact, a demand. In the name of the people that we serve. In the name of the people that do eat out of those trash bins. In the name of people who are raising their children out of the backs of cars, if they're lucky enough to have cars, and out of abandoned buildings. We ask you to do whatever you have to do, regardless of how difficult it may be, regardless of the other considerations that you have to deal with. You do whatever it takes to make sure that people do not eat out of garbage pails in a country as wealthy as this, that people don't live and die out on the streets, that there is adequate housing, that on the 7th of October there be a half a million to a million people in this city to demand simple economic justice because it takes that kind of demand to secure justice. And if you see people on the street, don't walk by them. They're your sisters and brothers. Acknowledge them. Communicate with them. Help them in some way because each time we walk past one of those people and do nothing, we become less human, as do they. And each time we communicate, we relate, we in some way reach out to those people we regain a small portion of our own humanity and they of theirs. And it's in that reaching out and touching with a sense of urgency that all change and all good things occur. So if you do that, the world will be a better place to live. If you do that and you do that with a sense of compassion and a sense of commitment and a sense of urgency, quickly changes will be made. And if you don't, then the situation will continue to deteriorate. It will get worse. It will get worse than anything anyone in this country can even imagine at this point. And so the cost and consequence of walking by and doing nothing or just remaining a small community and not addressing those other larger issues is far too high to pay. So I thank you for inviting me here to be with you and God bless you. In the name of Allah, the Beneficent and Merciful, I greet you with the traditional greetings of Islam. Assalamu alaikum, peace be upon you. The name of this first session is Politics and Contemporary Social Issues, Developing an Islamic Approach. And as our speaker inaugurating this session has made very clear, there are many prob problems in this country. Muslims are taught in their book, their holy book, the Quran, and through the teachings of their prophet Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him, that 
involvement in the issues of this world is not a luxury. It is not something that is a appenditure to their religion. Involvement in the issues of the society in which any Muslim lives is not a choice, it is a necessity. If Muslims are not involved in trying to create a better world, then they are a part of the problem that exists in society. Muslims, therefore, the five million strong community here in this country has an impulse, a demand to become more involved. Many of us throughout this country are involved. And we will be hearing from some of these uh, brothers and sisters today. But there is much that needs to be done. And the purpose of this session, the purpose of this conference, is to push us a further step in becoming more involved. Our purpose is not to put a bandage on society, to be simply a do-gooder. Our purpose is to create a civilizational alternative. As Mitch actually said, the problem that many people look at are really the branches of the problem. We have to look to the root. And the root is direction of civilization. And we as Muslims, must offer alternatives that address the total picture. Our first speaker will be Dr. Hakeem Mohammed Rashid. Brother Hakeem is an associate professor and chairperson of the Department of Human Development at Howard University in Washington, DC. Brother Rashid received his PhD in education and psychology from the University of Michigan he is a member of the Association of Muslim Social Scientists and recently published an article on the socialization of Muslim children in America in the American Journal of Islamic Social Scientists. Dr. Hakeem Rashid. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. I bear witness that there is no God worthy of worship except Allah. I bear witness that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. Assalamu alaikum. I'd like to first of all thank the ISNA Political Action Committee for the invitation to talk about the family crisis and this family crisis as it, emer as it relates to the emerging Muslim political agenda. Allah says in the Quran, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, O you who believe, protect yourselves and your families from a fire whose fuel is men and stones. The Quran thus commands believers to save their families from what must be considered the ultimate crisis, or family crisis, if you will, the crisis of the hellfire. When we talk about family crisis, it is important that we distinguish between the crisis in American families in general, the crisis in various subgroups of American families, and the crisis in Muslim families. Furthermore, it is essential that we understand that there is a direct relationship between various kinds of family crises and involvement in the political process. Overall, American families are beset with a variety of problems. 50% of American marriages fail. Hundreds of thousands of American children are victimized by incest, abuse, and neglect at the hands of their parents. And an unchecked materialism has produced a generation of Americans who judge their fellow human beings by the kind of car they drive and the name stitched on the back of their blue jeans. When we look at certain subgroups of American families, the concept of crisis becomes an understatement. 
If we examine the plight of African-American families, for example, over the past two decades, we see an ever-escalating pattern of economic and social deterioration. In 1968, 20% of African-American families had incomes below the poverty level. In 1987, the figure was 30%. And as we know, the poverty level, the official poverty level, is not a true indicator of poverty. There are many more people truly in poverty. The unemployment rate for African Americans was twice as high in 1988 as it was in 1968. The proportion of female-headed households in the African American community went from 28% in 1969 to 42% in 1983. Over half of all African American children are born out of wedlock. Yet it is within the African American community that the largest number of converts to Al Islam is occurring. Clearly, American families have a multitude of problems problems that affect both their interests and involvement in the political process. Nearly one half of all eligible voters set out the last presidential election. Many local and state elections attract barely 20% of those eligible to cast their ballots. Perhaps it is the quality of candidates that keeps people away from the polls. But it is also clear that those whose lives must, be, must revolve around be rebuilding a dysfunctional family or simply surviving economically cannot, cannot and will not take an active role in the political process. This brings us to the Muslim family and the crisis that affects the realization of its political potential. Muslim families in America are diverse, and many of the same factors that erode American family life in general, particularly materialism and poverty, also erode Muslim family life. I would argue, however, that the real crisis in the Muslim family is the crisis of continuity, that is, the transmission of an Islamic identity from one generation to the next. The accumulation of political power is an intergenerational process, one that requires political socialization strategies directed at younger generations. For Muslims, the foundation of this political socialization process must be the recognition that there can be no viable Islamic presence in America, political or otherwise, without a mechanism for promoting a secure Islamic identity within Muslim children. Muslim children who are victimized by an identity crisis in terms of their and their parents' commitment to al-Islam certainly cannot be expected to push an Islamic political agenda as adults. One can go around the country and find Muslim children getting pregnant, selling drugs, and generally immersed in the decadent elements of, of American society. I believe that these children, however, in it, are in a, an extreme minority and don't reflect the true crisis in Muslim family life. And this crisis is the conflict within the minds of many Muslim children concerning who they are and who and what they ultimately want to be. How committed will they be? How committed will our Muslim children be to Al-Islam when they're 18, when they're 21, when they're 25, when it's time to really take an active role in bringing about change in American culture. 
Muslim adults must commit themselves to the development of the institutional infrastructure that will allow Muslim children to feel secure in the development of their Islamic identity. Islamic schools, Islamic community centers, Islamic social organizations, Islamic family support groups. All of these play a role in the overall socialization of Muslim children. They clearly, therefore, have a role to play in the political socialization of Muslim children, that process through which children acquire political values and behaviors. Muslim children must feel comfortable arguing the, suprem the supremacy of Sharia over man-made laws. Muslim children must feel comfortable advocating Shura over simple majority rule. And Muslim children must feel comfortable with the Islamic worldview that argues in an uncompromising fashion that the law of Allah, as articulated in the Quran, supersedes the law of Western man. Until Muslim children and their parents reach this kind of comfort level with their own Islamic identities and the Islamic approach to politics, the crisis in Muslim families will continue. It is a crisis that clearly has political implications, but its spiritual implications are much more profound. To conclude, Allah says in Surah 31, Ayat 22 of the Quran, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, whoever submits his whole self to Allah and is a doer of good has grasped indeed the most trustworthy handhold. And with Allah rest the end and decisions of all affairs. This is the ultimate Islamic approach to politics and the, the ultimate solution to the Islamic family crisis, the Muslim family crisis. The more we submit our whole selves and not just a part of ourselves to Allah, the more success we will have in our family lives, our political lives, and of course, the hereafter. And the more success we have in truly being Muslim, truly practicing al-Islam, the more success America will have in solving its numerous family problems. Assalamu alaikum. Our next speaker is John Sullivan. Brother John is presently practicing as a psychotherapist, doing uh, drug counseling, marriage counseling, and other counseling. For eight years, he served as director of the prison program at the Islamic Teaching Center in Plainfield, Indiana, under the Islamic Society of North America. He has a Master's of Social Work degree, which he received in 1971 from the University of Missouri. And he presently also serves as Vice President of the African American Society for Humanitarian Aid and Development. And his topic will be crime and prison program. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. La ilaha illallah Muhammadan Rasulullah. Kul hu Allahu ahad, Allahu samad, lam yalid wa lam yulad, wa lam yakun lahu kufuwan ahad. The crux of my presentation and the paper that I prepared has to do with communication. Um, so let me clarify a point right away. Uh, it was mentioned that I'm the vice president of the African American Society, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, and I know s some of my brothers are saying, wait a minute now, uh, how can that be? It's not African-American, it's African-American. 
and that's, that's how that works. But you see the importance of words. Uh, you see the importance of a hyphen or a slash. And what I want to talk about today is that what is even more important than words is the context in which words are used, the context in which we behave. In fact, I want to talk about the context of operation. I'm going to begin by making a few main points and then I will try to give as many illustrations of these points as time allows before I sum up. The crucial questions which should be the priority uh, for Muslims living in the United States uh, have to do with A, do we align ourselves with fellow Americans to solve domestic and international issues? B, do we work primarily with Muslims worldwide to establish an Islamic society somewhere on this planet, as presently none exist? And C, do we do both? You see, that says which should be the priority. And I don't know. Uh, I do have some ideas about what will be the priority. I anticipate that there will be certain Muslims who will say, I don't work with anybody except Muslims, and they won't. And then there will be some Muslims who say, I'll work with anybody, and they will. And then there will be some Muslims who will do both. I don't know what should happen because I'm not an Islamic scholar. I'm not equipped to address that answer, uh, that question, but I do think this is what will happen. I just hope and pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that those Muslims who choose to do one or the other or both are not ostracized by another Muslim who didn't make that choice. The other point that I would like to make is that the purpose of my presentation is to point out a major obstacle to working jointly with non-Muslims when it comes to problem solving and how this obstacle manifests itself in two particular areas, one being crime, working on issues of crime, and the other has to do with working on the issues of prison programming. I've already stated that this major obstacle has to do with communication and my focus is the context of operation or as we say colloquially where are you coming from you know if you're about to talk to somebody and you're in the conversation and all of a sudden you get lost or you don't seem to understand at all what they're talking about you tend to ask them where are you coming from this is a question of what is your context Two quick examples, concrete examples of the idea of context. Muslims begin whatever they're about to do or say with bismillah. This is the context from which we operate. It's also a way to check ourselves. If what we are about to do or say cannot be done in that context, in the name of Allah, then we should not do it. Another example of context. Many times when there's a presentation and there is a mixed audience of Muslims and non-Muslims, uh, the non-Muslims will applaud the speaker. Their context is to focus their praise on the speaker. The Muslims come from a different context of operation and this context of operation says that all praise belongs to Allah. Therefore, we will respond with takbir, Allahu Akbar. Another, another major question that I wanted to at least bring up, and I think that this conference has begun to deal with this issue, and I hope it continues to do so. That question being, can Muslims best illustrate the superiority of the Islamic system of justice, politics, morals, economics, etc.? Can they best illustrate this superiority with workshops and conferences in which we invite judges, attorneys, and legislators to participate, or can they best do this by reestablishing an Islamic society somewhere on this planet? And at that point, point to the Islamic society so that the non-Muslims can compare and contrast this system 
to the Islamic system. Years ago, when I first became Muslim, prior to the time when at least I was able to hear about the uh, efforts in Islamic banking in the world, I used to say to my father, you know, you ought to take your money out of the bank and put it in a Muslim bank. And he says, okay, uh, where is one? Now, returning to my theme, again, I'm going to try to give some examples of operating out of different contexts. Let's take the issue of crime, related to the issue of crime. We can use as an example of the diverse context of operations the commonly heard statement, you can't legislate morality. One Islamic response to this statement can be, there is no need to. To understand each position, we need to know more about the context of operation for the Muslim and non-Muslim who come together to work on the issue of crime. The context of operation for the non-Muslim is the principle of separation between secular and sacred. And this is treated not as a construct imposed upon creation, which it is, it's treated as a reality. Operating in this context, people resent the fact that the state attempts to legislate any part of the sacred world, that is morals, beliefs, or values. The perceived intrusion by sacred rules or laws into their private secular lives is also greatly resented. Thus we hear it said, the preacher can tell me not to drink beer on Sunday morning in his church, but he better not tell me I can't have a beer on Sunday afternoon. Or conversely, the boss can fire me for not getting my work done, but if he fires me for having an affair with his wife, he'll have a lawsuit on his hands he won't soon forget. This kind of confused thinking comes from a context of operation in which these people have artificially and arbitrarily divided reality into secular and sacred. Turning now to the Islamic response to this question, a Muslim might say there is no need to legislate morality. Now we may find this uh, totally misinterpreted, this statement, by both Muslims and non-Muslims until it's placed in its proper context. Saying moral legislation isn't needed does not mean that such legislation is not necessary. It means that the need does not exist, since it has already been met. What is the context of this belief and conclusion? Within the Islamic context of reality, uh, reality is not perceived as having been arbitrarily and artificially separated into sacred and secular. Our creator is Rab, the sustainer and provider for all creation. As the lawgiver, he has provided laws for all aspects of creation. Creation knows the laws which govern it through instinct and the natural unfolding of life. Humans know their laws through their conscience, through common sense, and through revelation. In Islam, what is legal, halal, is at the same time healthy and moral. Therefore, the Muslim would also say, you can't legislate morality. But these four words, you can't legislate morality, would have a total different meaning coming from the lips of a Muslim. To the Muslim, this means that man is incapable of this act. This is precisely why our Creator, who is most merciful, did not place the burden or responsibility of moral legislation upon our backs in the first place. And in the Quran, in the English translation, we know that it says, on no soul doth Allah place a burden greater than it can bear. The Muslim would say there's no need to do this because it's already been done. The non-Muslim hearing just the statement there's no need to legislate morality would not understand that statement at all unless they understood the basic context from which we come. The basic context from which non-Muslims come is non-revelation. The basic context from which Muslim comes is revelation. 
and it's questionable how close such people can ever come in terms of communication. I don't have time for other examples, but in summary, let me share this with you. I said that there is a, that part of the problem has to do with different contexts of operation. But listen to this. It is not simply that our context of operation is different from the non-Muslim, even though this alone would make working jointly on social issues very difficult. No, there is more to it than simply a difference in perspective. Our context of operation, which is revelation and taqwa, the consciousness of our creator. This context of operation awakens within the non-Muslim that which he struggles to deny, that which he has built an elaborate structure called the separation of church and state. He has built this structure in order to assist him in his denial. Denial of what? Denial of the testimony that his soul made with the creator prior to coming into this reality. In the Quran, in the English translation, it says, when thy Lord drew forth from the children of Adam, from their loins, their descendants, and made them testify concerning themselves, am I not your Lord who cherishes and sustains you? They said, yea, we do testify. And you see, as long as any human being takes a path that is separate from the path that the soul was created to take, which is submission to its creator, they will never know what we call mental health. They will never know serenity. And dealing with the Muslims upsets these people because their soul is already trying to explain to them what their purpose in life should be. They have suppressed this. They have kept it out of their consciousness and we keep reminding of, uh, them of that. It is this It is this and nothing else that elicits such irrational behavior and venom from non-Muslims when they interact with Muslims. And of course, to sum it up, we have to go back to the Quran because Allah says things in the best of ways. And the Quran is the best of language. And I apologize for the fact that I'm reading this in an English translation. But this is what Allah says about the reaction of non-Muslims to Muslims when the Muslims try to develop something on their own. And I'm suggesting that it has to do with us awakening what is already in their soul. It says, Muhammad is the apostle of Allah, and those who are with him are strong against unbelievers, but compassionate among each other. Thou wilt see them bow and prostrate themselves in prayer, seeking grace from Allah and his good pleasure. On their faces are their marks, being the traces of their prostration. This is their similitude in the Torah, and their similitude in the gospel is like a seed which sends forth its blade then makes it strong it then becomes thick and it stands on its own stem filling the sores with wonder and delight as a result it fills the unbelievers with rage at them Allah has promised those among them who believe and do righteous deeds forgiveness and a great reward assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Our next speaker is Sister Sharifa Al Khatib. Sister Sharifa has been an activist for 25 years in many fields and areas. She has worked as a teacher here in this country and overseas, both in elementary school and uh, later teaching in college. She has a master's in comparative religion and she presently works as the man managing editor for the American Journal of Islamic Social Scientists. And as a footnote, she ran recently for the Board of Education in the Fair Fairfax County here in the D.C. area. And her topic will be education. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى أهله وصحبه أجمعين 
I need to talk louder? Okay. I'm, I'm a bit short. Um, I'm very happy that I was asked to speak today about education because I believe that education is one of the most important areas that Muslims have to address. And while our objective, our final objective, is not just to become part of the system that we experience now and that we see, our objective, our final objective, is to create our own Islamic systems and not only create Islamic systems for Muslims, but to look at all the other people who are sharing this country with us as potential Muslims. And if we look at them as potential Muslims and feel that we have the obligation which Allah has told us to try to bring them into the same style of thinking, into the same uh, way of behaving, into the same objectives that we have, then we have to have some way that we can communicate with them and some way we can work with them. And in that long-range process of making America Muslim, all of America Muslim, then we have to have some actual short-range goals. We have to have some way of dealing with them and know how we're going to deal with them and in which ways and be very calculated about it or else we will not accomplish our goals. Is education political? Yes, it is. Education is extremely political because it shapes our minds, it shapes, it shapes our idea of who we are and what we are, it shapes our ideas of what we can be. Um, yesterday when I was listening to one of the other speakers, I, uh, 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 I became amused because it reminded me of a situation with my own little daughter. It wasn't a speaker actually, it was a person who stood up from the audience and said, we're not American, we're Muslim. Well, I've always brought my children up, alhamdulillah, to think of themselves first, last, and always as Muslim. When we lived overseas in a Muslim country, I let them identify themselves as Muslims. And we lived there for 10 years. When we came back a year ago, my little daughter, who's in second grade, kept saying to her teacher, I'm not American, I'm Muslim. And after a while, I, kept, I started getting notes coming home saying, what does she mean? You know? And I got the same sort of notes from the school where we were overseas in a Muslim country, so-called Muslim country. The principal said, what does she mean? And she was in a Muslim country. And they would say, well, you're American, right? She said, no, I'm Muslim. And the principal here said the same thing. That shows that we have similar kinds of problems in approaching the field of education, whether we're living in a so-called Muslim country or whether we're living here in the United States. Six months later, my daughter came to me and said, is there another thing that we're called American? You know, she still isn't quite sure about it. Alhamdulillah, she's still identifying herself as a Muslim. I wanted to show, first of all, what did the Prophet ﷺ do in Mecca and in Medina uh, in terms of education? Education was a priority for the Prophet. On, a, on an individual level, he used to spend hours and hours and hours just discussing things with people, listening to their problems, listening to their questions, answering them, and on a personal level, every single Asr time, afternoon time, he spent with his family educating them. He did not say, well, I'm a leader now and I don't need to do that. He spent every single afternoon with his family, exclusively, teaching them. And I would like to ask how many of our Muslim fathers and Muslim husbands do that today? The most active ones among the Muslims say, well, I'm a leader now. I don't have time for my family. And if they're not a leader, they say, that's what women are supposed to do. And they don't carry on that responsibility. The Prophet ﷺ was our best example. He spent 13 years in Mecca preparing minds. He spent 13 years preparing personalities. He spent 13 years developing a concept. And then he took it to Medina. And he carried it on there and it was public and it was established. And once he carried it on and once he established it, he didn't leave it there. He continued to build it even to a better extent. Now what did the Prophet do salam, when he was in Medina? He had to deal not only with Muslims, but with pagans and with Jews. And he did use deferential treatment. He did use different kinds of treatment between the three groups. But he drew their focus to the fact that there is something called an Islamic State and you are going to be a part and parcel of that Islamic State. 
Are we at that position now? We're not. Can we try to act as if there is nothing out there, there is no public school education going on? No, we can. We are in the process of developing Islamic education for our children. And yes, all of us have the hope and dream, inshallah, of creating not only Islamic schools that cooperate with, with each other, but Islamic school systems that would span the country. That's where our, our further objective is, is. And we want to make those schools so good that the non-Muslims will be signing up in long lists to enter them because they're excellent. We want to be dedicated to excellence. But are we there yet? No. We're not. So in the meantime, what do we do with the millions of Muslim children who are going to public school? We've got to do something with them and we've got to be involved in some way. In, 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 in dealing with this process, in dealing with the process of reaching our larger goals, we have to define who we are and what we are. And the major part of that definition is to remember the eye of Allah. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Ma khalaqna jins wal insan illa ta'abuduni. I did not create men and jinn except to worship me. So that our whole life, our whole life and our whole service, our whole, as Allah said in the Quran, my life, my service of sacrifice, my life and my death are all for Allah, the cherisher and sustainer of the world. So education is just one part of that. It's not separated from it. So as we approach the public school system, we have to approach it with that, with that credo, that we see ourselves as worshiping Allah and being involved with them in any way. At the same time, we cannot accept the definitions that other people try to tell us. We cannot accept definitions that non-Muslims shape for us. In recent times, they try to tell us that we have only two alternatives. We either have the alternative of becoming a second-class citizen to the Judeo-Christian heritage, and we will never be first-class citizens in that case, or our other alternative is to become part of a, in quotes, pluralistic society. And a pluralistic society right now is really a catchword for secular humanism. Are those our only alternatives? No. Can we shape our own? Yes. Should we be shaping them instead of asking non-Muslims to shape our definition of ourselves? Yes. Why do we wait and why do we have this inferiority complex that tells us that we cannot define our own agenda? Yes, we can define our own agenda, and that agenda is Islam, and what our question is, is not what our agenda is, but how to work it out toward the proper goal of worshiping Allah. In the Quran, we are asked to agree with the Ahl al-Kitab, the Christians and the Jews, on what, what basic concepts we have in common, and that is belief in Allah. We have belief in Allah as a common concept, we have belief in Allah as a common concept, and we can try in our own ways to see how we can work out an agreement with them on that issue. We believe in the last day. They do too. We believe in a judgment day. We believe in an afterlife. Let us see how we can interface with them and interact with them in a way where we'll be able to express Islamic values and get them to come to the conclusions of the values that we do share. Um, there are certain questions that we have to ask in this process. For what purpose education? And we, in, we realize that the purpose of American public education is to create orderly consumers who obey the law and do exactly what they're told and buy a lot of things and sell a lot of things and make money move in the society so that the people who are rich can get richer and they can keep their positions as they are. That is how the American economic and the American educational system works at the moment. But our purposes are different. The purposes of education for a Muslim are to gain knowledge about everything, to look at everything as a source of knowledge and to use that knowledge for the good of all humanity. Now, if we realize that, then we should be involved. We should be involved at every level, the local level, the county level, the state level, the national level, and the international level. How are we going to be involved? We want to be involved as a distinct Islamic entity. And I, I say Islamic and not Muslim because there are lots of Muslims running around who don't even know what their agenda is and who start defining their agenda through the eyes of non-Muslims. So that I want to say Islamic. 
And if we are Islamic individuals and we come to our, our relationship and our connection with the public school system as Islamic individuals, then we will not be part of the great, what they call, American melting pot. We do not want to melt into American society and disappear. We want to go into American society with Islamic ideals and revamp their thinking. We want to revamp them. We want to turn them into Muslim individuals. We shouldn't have feelings of, of a distaste for them or, or intolerance because they're potential Muslims. In the beginning there, of, 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 of Islam, in the, at the time when it first entered Arabia, of course Islam started from the beginning of the world. But when we identify it with the movement that Muhammad salam, brought and perfected, they weren't Muslims, they were pagans. At least the people in this country have many, many things that they recognize. One of them is a belief in God. Even if it's a tacit agreement that there is a God, they have this belief and we can work on that. How should we be involved? We have to be involved in a very diligent way, in a very concise way. We have to be involved in a way where we sit down and make long-range planning and understand how we can be involved uh, uh, so that when we do something, we choose what we do, and we do the amount of work that we know we can carry on consistently. The Prophet ﷺ said he likes us to be involved in consistent work. He doesn't like us to start something and drop it. He wants us to start something and continue with it. There are certain obstacles. Muslims have a lot of character building to do before they can even begin to communicate with the larger society. Muslims are lazy, they're late, they, play, they like to argue with each other, they like to fight with each other more than they fight with non-Muslims. They have an inability to analyze and synthesize ideas. They're not solution-oriented, they're problem-oriented. Um, and they have a real problem with constructive criticism, and they have even a greater problem if that constructive criticism comes from women. We have another problem, that is our conception of ourselves and the non-Muslim conception of who we are. A lot of times we define who we are by what they say we are. And a lot of times our definition is defined by what we want and not what Allah wants. One speaker yesterday, uh, uh, Siraj Wahaj, talked about Allah's agenda. How many of us really are trying to institute Allah's agenda and not our own? Um, most of the non-Muslims see us as other because they don't see us. Muslims are not involved in anything when it comes to education, politically, or any otherwise. Muslims are very quiet. They're almost ashamed to say, I'm Muslim. I went to a local high school in the area where I live uh, about six months ago, and I knew about 30 of the Muslim children who were in that one Muslim high school, and among all the 30, there were only two kids who said, Assalamu alaikum. They were ashamed to signify that they were Muslim. I thought that was pitiful. And these kids come from so-called activist Muslim parents who haven't even built in their children the pride to say, Assalamu alaikum. We have to start motivating ourselves and our children to be further involved. If you don't mind, I'll just take about three minutes. Is that all right? No? <laughs> I just asked the chair if it's all right. Okay. Um, to talk about what kinds of involvements we can have. On the local level, we need to volunteer much more readily than we do now. The way to get recognition, the way to get acceptance, the way to ex be able to be in a position to express Muslim concepts is to volunteer. First thing is the PTA. Most Muslims are not involved in the PTA whatsoever, the Parent Teacher Association. They don't even go to the meetings. They don't know what's going on with their kids in the public school. Second thing are the school board meetings. School board meetings are public. In a lot of cities, they have them on television, which is wonderful. You don't even have to go out of your house. Just turn it on and find out what they're doing with your kids in the public school. Comes on every month. If, it's, if it doesn't come on, make an effort to go at least three or four times a year to the school board meeting and find out what they're talking about, what their ideas are. Okay, you can become an office assistant. You can become a reading assistant. You can become a library assistant and try to give buy Islamic books or get them from organizations and give them to your local school library, you should try and we should all be involved in developing Arabic language courses in the public schools because one way of introducing non-Muslims to Islam is to have them come and be a part of Arabic courses, Arabic language courses. 
And don't forget, classical Arabic is the Quranic Arabic. So when we say Arabic courses, we're talking about classical Arabic, and our real agenda is Quranic Arabic. And that's a good way of introducing Islam to non-Muslims. We should try to be on the book review committees. Um, there are, there are um, uh, uh, book review committees for every type of subject, for the social studies books, for the literature books. Muslims need to join those book review committees and see what they're writing and have an input into how the curriculum will be. The book companies do listen to these book review committees and they have to adjust because if they don't, they won't be bought for that school system. We should be involved in the family life education. In Fairfax County, for instance, they just passed a new family life education uh, 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 um, curriculum uh, for, uh, not the curriculum, but the plans for the curriculum that are teaching our kids horrific things. For instance, they're going to teach our children from first grade and, uh, and second grade and third grade that they may or may not accept a, a, a friendly touch from their parents. And if they don't like the touch, they should stand up loudly and say no. They're teaching them this from kindergarten. And unless we know what they're teaching, we will not be able to change it. They're teaching our seventh graders that this classroom teachers are going to sit there and decide for your child what their future goals should be. That's part of family life education. They were going to teach them that abortion centers are a community resource. This is all part of family life education. If you don't know what it is, you cannot help. You cannot change the ways things are going to be taught. You've got to get in there and be involved. The Human Relations Committee. Muslims should join the Human Relations Committee because many of the issues that impinge on, on the way Muslims, Muslims are uh, being taught are dealt with in the Human Relations Committee. We should join teachers' unions and encourage Muslim children to be teachers. We should join the Gifted Children Program, the Personnel Advisory Committee, and the School Board. We should try to be on the School Board. On a county level, they have the Human Rights Commission, the Human Services Council, the Juvenile Court Advisory Committees, Drug Committees, Board of Education that we should have, try to have members on, as I said, the Mayor's Advisory Council, and with the State Board of Education. On the national level, we have the National Education Association, the American Federation of Teachers, to name a few. We need, inshallah, in the future to develop a National Muslim Council of Education. And within that National Muslim Council of Education, we need to do many, many things, a few of which are to make a list of acceptable books for the book companies, to have a speakers bureau for schools, to have a, 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 um, a federal funds data bank so that we can let Muslims know what federal funds are available that they can have access to, to have a federal law data bank so that Muslims know what the federal laws are, to use them for the good of Muslims. We should be able to have a national place where we distribute Islamic books to public school systems, and we should coordinate the outreach programs to, mus to teachers and to non-Muslims through the public school systems. I hope that inshallah we will at some point be able to develop such a national council. Shukran. Wassalamu alaikum wa Our last speaker is Dr. Yusuf Klai. Brother Yusuf is, this, is an assistant professor of international human rights law, formerly at Chicago State University and beginning in the fall at the University of Regina in Canada. He also serves as the executive director for the International Human Rights Association of American Minorities. He has a PhD from the University of Laval in Quebec, Canada, and a certificate from the Hague Academy of International Law. He has author, authored many books, including International Law and the Black Minority in the U.S., The Black Book, The True Political Philosophy of Malcolm X, and just recently, The Anti-Social Contract. And I might add as a footnote, Brother Yusuf has been involved uh, for many years uh, and with uh, Malcolm himself in the founding of the Organization of Afro-American Unity and served as the chairman for the Organization of Afro-American Unity in Canada, Brother Yusuf, whose topic will be racial problems. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. <coughs> Alhamdulillah. Assalamu alaikum. 
Uh, racial problems is not one of my favorite subjects. However, I shall, inshallah, do my best to, um, to help demystify the great amount of uh, what I consider confusion that has developed around this problem in the United States. I would like to thank, I, I would like to take this opportunity to thank those responsible for this conference for giving me the, uh, I would like to thank those of you who are responsible for this conference for giving me the opportunity to be here and I shall take a few moments to speak on the subject of racism, racial problems. As I've said, this is not my favorite subject, but I shall attempt as much as possible to, uh, do, to help demystify, say a few words that will help demystify this problem as, it, as these problems as they have developed in the United States. Now the most pure, purest and classical meaning of racism is peria de zotra. That is fear of the other people, of the other. However, if we take this classical definition of racism and try to make some meaning of it in the United States, we will not be very, we will very, very likely be unsuccessful. It doesn't mean very much within the context of what we are experiencing and what has been experienced in the United States. In order to better understand what racism, our racial problems mean in the United States, we must go back and look at the very foundation of the United States. The early history of America witnessed a European fanaticism profound, so profound, that it permitted the brutal enslavement of millions of Africans and the dispossession of near genocide of countless Native American nations, some more developed than others, each with its own unique culture, history, and socio-political organization. In order that such uncompromising brutality and devastation could occur, there was need for a dehumanization of the attitude towards such people beyond that normally found among conquerors toward the conquered, who often became assimilated among the very people they vanquished. We shall see then how racism was used to fill this particular need. But first, I would like to say to you something about the people who came to the United States, the first settlers. Uh, I'm not going to go through the preparation I had, so I'm going to, it's going to be very fairly brief, and I hope it will be adequate. These were not the typical uh, average European. These are people, very special people, among many of the, uh, many which are commented, myths commented made by many scholars who wrote, write about this period. They were Europeans who were willing to leave their homes, their families, willing to go and settle in a new land, they were motivated by wealth, by the concept of profit, more than, much more than uh, the average European was. So these people had a type of buccaneering spirit. And a part of this, we are going to see, served to form some of the problems that we now refer to under the concept of racism. The founding of the U.S., there was a purpose involved, and the broad purpose was to create in the United States a new race from the European races. And that new race, that new ethne, which we see in South Africa also, which was attempted to be created in Nigeria, was to be called the white ethne the white people. This ethne uh, would be consist by the assimilation of all the other European races into one 
based on the color of their skin. So it became very important in the psyche of the American people, more than in Europe or any other people, the color of the skin. And this then gives us some of the first very basic foundation for what we have come to be struggle with in the United States and call racism, and which is fundamental to many of the what we call racial problems. Now, after we have seen the absolute importance as race, of racism as a tool to justify the wrestling of territory of North America from the hands of its original owners, and how racism gradually evolved as a tool used to galvanize European people for the development of white nationalism, and as the implementation, implementing agent of white nationalism, and as a major factor in the maintenance of white nationalism, its presence is felt in every corner of American life, even in areas where the question of minority and majority conflict, conflicting economic interests may not seem to be an issue. In keeping with the needs of the uh, requirements of this white nationalism, this development of this white ethne that would be a type of super ethne, uh, and of course would also be uh, Anglo-Saxonized, Racism in the U.S. is promoted and maintained through a variety of ever-changing epitaphs of confirmation. The haves and the have-nots, the winners and the losers, the yuppies and the underclass, the powerless and the movers and shakers, the, the wealthy and the poor, the homeless and the homeowners, the inner cities and the suburb. One is, almost good. One is always good, the other is always bad. One is always composed chiefly of the white ethne and the other chiefly of the minorities. All the categories and symbols that the U.S. use to define its society and institutions serve equally to confirm and support the U.S. historical maximum so crucial to the raison d'etre of white nationalism, that whites are superior to blacks and others, that Anglo-Saxonized Americans are racially superior to all other white races. Thus, racism in the U.S. is not a peri de d'autre, it's not fear of the other, but an historically developed system of ordering and orientating U.S. society in keeping with the myth of racial superiority and racial inferiority, from which derives the most important notions of the right of the superior to dominate the inferior. Anglo-American, uh, the U.S. minorities are portrayed as the problematic element of the Anglo-Saxon nation. The black element, the poor element, the underclass. For the purpose of their continual socio-cultural domination, their right to be different from the Anglo-American in ways that their history and culture has made them different, it's totally denied. So, uh, to summarize, fundamentally, the question of racism in the United States may not really, the, may not, the, the question, there is racism, there is racism in many countries, and everywhere, but the problem of racism, or the racial, what we call racial problems, may not be racial problems at all. They might be problems of colonialism, domestic colonialism. They might be problems of people trying to maintain privilege over other people. They might be problems of the, uh, history, historical problems, problems of an, an original Anglo-Saxon element that is determined to maintain and Anglo-Saxonize every other group that enter the states. And is that unable to, uh, to have, a, to accept a type of uh, plural, cultural pluralism that many other nations have experienced. Therefore, uh, therefore, when we talk about uh, the problems of racism in the United States, I think it's very important and our effort to demystify, to demystify this element and to go behind, Muslims must go behind the, the label of racism. We must not stop at this idea we must look behind it and see what is the real problem. Why is this group of people in the situation? What is the problem for the Muslim in the school, as was mentioned here? Is it racism? Is it uh, just that 
that school has not adopted the right of Muslims to their culture. What, what is the problem? And I think this is, uh, this is uh, mostly the, the, the approach that I think will be most beneficial to us uh, as Muslims. America or America, land of the free, home of the brave, execution of the Indians, master of the slaves. Racism is of the sweet land of liberty. Thank you very much. Salam alaikum. Our session was to end at 10.30, and with the permission of the organizers, I am going to extend this session for 10 more minutes. So we will have 20 minutes for questions and answers. Anybody who would like to ask a question must ask it from the mic here in the aisle. And we have some written questions already. And I would like to ask the first one to Dr. Uh, Clyde himself. And uh, Brother Khaled wants to ask it himself. So I will acknowledge those who would uh, like to ask questions. And you can actually come up to the mic to save time also. Make your questions very short and to the point because we have little time. Assalamu alaikum. My question is, and it's, it's a two-part, and I wanted you to just elaborate on it briefly so we can get some lines of demarcation because we're talking about context here. Is it racism and white supremacy or both as a systematic approach to develop the development of a community perspective here that took place historically in the United States? I want to get uh, your, your input on that. Well, I think it's not either. What it is, is that we have to look at the way the U.S. was formed. It's more or less white nationalism. It is a farm, it was formed, the U.S. was formed basically to utilize the resources and to give uh, privileges to European races. The problem that these people had when they did this was basically one, of the races in Europe were not necessarily friendly. Uh, what basis did they have in common which they could unite? It was their skin. And it's on this basis that the U.S., this emphasis was placed here in order to do that. And therefore, from this white nationalism evolved racism naturally because it's, it was necessary to maintain. It was necessary in order to, to, to carry out a program of white nationalism. Or, uh, and, and from this evolved racial superiority because the, the, the actual formation was to bring about this particular sort of super white race. And in doing so, there were other people in the States. There were the Africans who had to be disowned or, or disconnected from identification with the actual identity, cultural and historical identity of the United States. There were the native people who had to be, their land had to be uh, uh, taken and uh, et cetera, et cetera, for the, to maintain the manifestation, the, to maintain the reason, the, the, the emphasis, the, the importance for this process. Otherwise, the process cannot take place. Uh, nobody would come if they could not get land. So these factors produce uh, white supremacy and racism okay. and maintained it. Shukran. Yes. So, Brother uh, Dr. Hakeem, it's just one question. Do you agree that uh, this crisis in the Islamic and the African American families are secondary to the crisis in the American family? If so, then do you think that uh, a better analysis would be that we call that we characterize our families as families in remission due to the struggle to throw off the yoke of racism, white supremacy, and and and, and secularism or satanic? oriented family, uh, uh, you know, uh, definitions as opposed to a crisis. Do you think it would be better to you look at it that way just in order to give the positive reinforcement of people who are, who are attempting to change the situation? Thank you. Okay, I'm not sure I picked up that last part of the question, but uh, I would make the distinction between the crisis in the overall African-American family and the crisis in the Muslim family, even the Muslim, African-American Muslim family. Um, I don't think that African American Muslim families are as beset by the problems of poverty and materialism or lack thereof 
of the African American, I guess you would say underclass, or even the so-called buppy, black urban professional in terms of his materialism. Um, but we, we have other issues that we have to deal with. You know, our children, many of our children, most of our children are in public schools. You know, they're, they're dealing with non-Muslim peers on a regular basis. Those values are being absorbed. Those non-Muslim values are being absorbed. Right. Mm. Sure. Mm. Call it, if you want to. Okay. The reason why I said remission as opposed to crisis because one denotes a negative stereotypical mm -hmm. definition when you say crisis. Remission, you're looking at, you know, because I, I, I refuse to look at my family or anybody that I'm associated with in a negative light. So I'm saying if we, if we look at it in, in terms of remission by we're beginning to rebuild and re-identify and reclaim our identities and move from that perspective. Do you think that that would be healthier in terms of defining and characterizing what we're dealing with? Oh, I agree. I agree that, but even within, in terms of using the, the term crisis, I don't think it necessarily has to be uh, viewed in a negative context. I think if we just recognize that some different kinds of things have to be done, uh, some different kinds of socialization strategies from the mainstream, uh, you know, recognizing that, that we want our children to be Muslim. We want them to carry that identity into adulthood. Uh, that has to be our number one objective because if we produce anything less than a Muslim adult, you know, those of us who are parents, if we produce, and only Allah really produces, but if, if what comes out at the end of that process of socialization after 18 years or so is anything less than a Muslim, an agnostic, an atheist, a secular humanist, then the process of socialization for us has been unsuccessful. You know, we have not been successful as Muslim parents. Now, we, we have to do all that we can do, and uh, only Allah knows who will ultimately be Muslim. Assalamu alaikum. I have uh, several questions. Uh, first question I'd like to uh, direct at, at Dr. Claude. Is that the right pronunciation? Claude, is that the right I'm not sure that's the right pronunciation. Caught. But my question is, uh, in Malcolm making his analysis of the problems of race and class, not only in American society, but in terms of world culture, and how he elevate that to an international uh, uh, context. Uh, and there are many Muslims who not only participate in terms of their local Muslim uh, activities, but also do a cross uh, or in integrated efforts with other, quote, African-American organizations that are promoting human social justice and those kinds of ideas. Do you foresee an agenda whereas that we can begin to move in the direction of putting the issue of race and class in an international context as Malcolm was trying to do just before assassination in uh, the audience of the UN, whereas that issues like reparations uh, for the impact of slavery, the impact of feminine disintegration that is occurring that's obviously a remnant of institutionalized slavery could possibly occur? Um, well, that question runs right into uh, one of the things that the organization... I'm sorry, he was... He was uh, that, that runs right into the thing that one of our organizations is doing, that is the organization of IRAM, the International, uh, the International Human Rights Association of American Minorities, we are attempting to, uh, to bring the case of American minorities, that include all the minorities, uh, uh, to the uh, United Nations. Because it's in this context that we'll be best able to deal with the type of problems and questions that you have brought up. I won't go into detail because you, know, you can go on and on with this. But I just want to say that it's, once, once you bring it within that context, you're going to find the, not only the conceptualization but the historical uh, uh, experience available in which you will be able better to understand your situation and also be able to understand the, the, uh, the, the, to bring into play in the United States concepts which will enable all Americans to understand their relations with other minorities. I'll leave it at that. Brother, I'm going to ask you um, just to 
have only one question. We only have a very short period of time. The other people. One short question. I'd just like to direct it at Brother uh, John Sutherland. Very okay. short. And that is when you illustrate it in your presentation, it varies groups of Muslims who care to either interact with Muslims or interact with other groups. The question that I have in mind is that uh, throughout this country, members of the, the Nation of Islam have taken a very proactivist role in the confrontation of drugs and drug activity, particularly in inner city communities, whereas the Sunni community in many incidents have not, particularly in the locale where I'm from. I just want to know what's your analysis in terms of integrating efforts as it relates to uh, developing strategies, uh, in that particular area of confronting drug usage, uh, confronting criminal elements, particularly in the inner city community. Integration between whom? M members of the Nation of Islam and Sunni community, or any for, the, for that matter, anyone who's basically moving in that direction to confront the onslaught of drugs that's, that's obviously having an impact. Whenever Muslims come together from the context of the Quran, then integration is not necessary. Uh, all that needs to be done is to work together. Yes, the next question. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. My uh, comment and question, uh, it's not really a question, but uh, first of all, for Sister Sharifa, uh, I thought the, I was the last three minutes of her presentation or five minutes uh, underscoring the importance of civic involvement is crucial and shouldn't be overlooked. I believe it is the most fundamental part of the political agenda uh, in the larger context that we have to uh, work on, the involvement in our school boards and libraries, etc. But as an educator, um, uh, Sister Sharifa, I would take exception, and you as an educator I mean, uh, I would take exception to this uh, perpetuating these myths and making blanket statements such as Muslims are lazy, Muslims are prob problem oriented, uh, Muslims are argumentative, Muslims don't deal with, uh, uh, don't listen to women, uh, Muslim men don't listen to women. I believe that, that uh, we are uh, in a constant educational process as you were underscoring in your last uh, response to the last question. And I think that when we perpetuate these myths uh, uh, and make blanket statements like that, we, don't, we do not educate. What we do is we demoralize, uh, the, uh, we demoralize the listeners, even if they are adults, and we uh, don't help them to be able to go beyond the problems. Instead of citing the problems with, with, um, uh, with surgical uh, care, I think when we make blatant statements like that, it's uh, it's detrimental. Instead of helping the uh, educational uh, ag uh, agenda that we would like to achieve. So I want to. Can I respond? Okay. Um, thanks for your criticism, Ibrahim. Uh, uh, I, I agree with you. We should be positive in the way we approach um, character building. But the reason I mention those is because Muslims do have these defects, not all of them and not always, but a lot of the time. And I think one way to begin to change ourselves is to recognize our limitations. If we say that we don't have a problem, how can we solve them? And we do have problems. And we have lots of problems of communication. We have a, lots of problems of tolerance between each other. Um, everybody wants, has their own agenda, and they don't want to listen to anyone else's. And unless we can learn to be solution-oriented, and unless we can learn to, to um, work toward the goals that we can all agree on, then we'll never move anywhere. And I, I, I didn't mean to be negative. I, I'm sorry I gave that impression. Because I believe that we have a great, great hope in this Muslim Ummah in the United States. I believe we have a fantastic hope in it to become the best that we can possibly be because we have the resources, we have the education, we have the motivation, we have the, the chance to create something very, very unique here that cannot be possibly created somewhere else. And uh, Allah says in the Quran, he's going to ask people on Judgment Day, um, how was their life? And they're going to say, well, it, it was miserable and oppressed. And he would say, I, didn't I make the earth large enough for you? And he did. He made this earth very large, alhamdulillah, and we have found ourselves here, whatever background that we're from, and we have a unique opportunity to be a Muslim United Nations. We can do whatever we want to do. The sky's the limit. Allah is the limit. But we just need to learn how to work together. We have fantastic possibilities, and our children, alhamdulillah, have even more possibilities than we have. We hope they're brighter than us, and we hope that they're going to be 
working together more smoothly than we do in Shanghai. Question here. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Uh, Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said that uh, we're not Muslims until we want for our brothers what we want for ourselves. Uh, I have, uh, I'm glad the issue uh, was mentioned of racism because uh, I'm not objective about it because it's something that happens that I feel was, was uh, uh, I can't stand on the outside and look at because I'm, you know, maybe a part of that in some sense. But uh, what I was saying was that I think that uh, sometimes Muslims that come in from other countries or, uh, or uh, maybe of a European descent might not recognize the, uh, the, the underdevelopment of the African-American community through institutional racism and how, how much that affects the development of the masjids and Islamic communities in, in America. Uh, what I, you know, a lot of times they come in and they build masjids in the suburbs uh, or have events in other localities other than the inner city, which I know is difficult to work with. What I'm, what I'm thinking is there's alienation through this white nationalism that's affecting the Muslim community. And uh, it may be in a subtle sense, but in any sense that it, that it happens, it's, it's not good. And we as Muslims have to check in ourselves that we don't you know, develop in separate communities you know, towards the same goals. Uh, I like to ask Mr. Sullivan if he feels uh, that in his observation as a Muslim that he sees from the other side, because I'm looking from one side, that this is as much of a problem as we see because this is something that I see and, and maybe it's not as, 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 maybe I'm too sensitive to the issue. Uh, in 1980 at a MSA convention I addressed this issue, first of all, I agree primarily with the statements that you made. Uh, I don't consider them to be too sensitive in any sense. Briefly, uh, the analysis that I gave in 1980 was that in many cases, not to make sweeping generalizations, but in many cases, in many cases you have Muslims coming to this country who at one time were either they were or their parents were colonial subjects. They moved from the position of being colonial subjects to neo-colonial subjects. When they came to this society, they ran into a group of Muslims, some, not to overgeneralize again, some of whom moved from the position of being slaves to the position of being colonial subjects. When they began to work together, many of the uh, things that the Muslims had left or thought they had left behind in their countries were stirred up once they started interacting with people who were once slaves and now colonial subjects. The dynamics here are very interesting when you get into looking what that says in terms of responses to each other and priorities, etc. cetera. Uh, I don't doubt that what you're saying is, is right on target in terms of where we see development and et cetera. And I don't consider it personally, uh, your comments to be uh, too sensitive at all. I want to thank our speakers. Unfortunately, we have been given the hook by the organizers. And uh, to remind you, the next session will be at 11 o'clock. And as we began, we must end with praises to Allah. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. I'm sorry the uh, organizers have asked us to end this uh, session. Uh, Okay, we have to give our, uh, the, one of the organizers has said, go ahead, so, please, go ahead. Assalamu alaikum. I'd like to address this question to Sister Sharifa. Now, regarding the issue of Muslim involvement in schools in particular, I'd like to share my experience as a student. Um, from, I graduated from Brooklyn Technical High School. I did a paper on... Um, value-laden words in high school history textbooks. Now I found that quite often when people describe Muslim history or any type of Arab history in our textbooks, in our history, te in our history textbooks, 
they use negative connotation and certain value-laden words that would sort of foster negative ideas about Muslims in general. Now, regarding Muslim involvement in the community, I also think that Muslims need to be involved in writing up literature and textbooks for our students, not only just reviewing them, but being, you know, making a, a very important, um, being very effective in their writing to our students, not only Muslim students, but students worldwide, because not only are Muslims often ignorant about their own history, but the world in general is ignorant about history altogether. And second of all, as a student going on to college, I've looked into, you know, colleges, um, you know, the best colleges that can possibly be because I want to be the best, I want to have the best possible education as a Muslim student. And um, addressing the issue of financial aid, um, there's all different kinds of scholarships for Jews, for Christians of all different types of ethnic minorities and so on and so forth, but the Muslims seem to have no scholarships and it's a very great burden on our parents and I was just wondering if there's any type of organization or some type of thing that we can do to help Muslim students get into the best colleges possible by providing some kind of Muslim scholarship. Thank you. Brief as possible. Um, on, on the first question, I, I couldn't agree with you more. We, um, it isn't enough to review the textbooks. Uh, this year, I did an in-depth review of all the textbooks in Fairfax County uh, for a, a committee I was on called Teaching About Religion in the Public Schools. And I was the only Muslim on the committee. And it was a wonderful experience because um, I was able in the report to put in a lot of Islamic points and the school system did accept the report, which I was surprised at. Um, um, one of the things, for instance, in one of the textbooks it said, um, uh, it gave uh, the, all the references about Judaism, for instance, were glowing and it said it formed the basis of Western culture. And then when it got to Islam, the first heading you read was Muslim invaders. And the only thing I talked about Muslims and Islam is how they've invaded various parts of the world. So you're right. That also creates the image in the child's mind, the Muslim children who are in that school system, of who they are and how much respect they do or don't have. So it isn't enough to just review those books because all the book companies care about is whether or not they're going to be able to sell them to the school system. We need to create our own textbooks that would be the kind of textbooks that could be used in a public school system. They can't be a book that's only about Muslim da'wah. They have to be a book, as you say, of history that could be used at every level of, of, of high school or junior high school. So we do need to work on that, and I think it should be a priority, I really do, of Muslim educators in the, in the various fields. About, um, about uh, uh, scholarships, um, we have a great lack of scholarships. Uh, I myself am in a quandary about how to fund my own daughter's education for next year. And it is a continuing problem. All of us have limited funds. It's hard to come up with $10,000 a year to send your child to school. And even if you send them to a, uh, to a uh, state school, you're going to be talking about at least $4,000 with all the costs involved. That's a lot of money. That represents half of the yearly salary for some Muslims, for a lot of Muslims. So it's, it's, um, it's a really difficult question. And unfortunately, for a, mod a lot of Muslim organizations, you go and ask them for scholarships. Uh, I went and asked for a scholarship for one girl who called me and said she's been accepted to a medical school in, in, in New York and didn't have the money to pay for it. And they said, we don't have any more scholarships. We stopped doing that. You know why? Because they gave out $3 million to Muslim students, lending it to them with the promise of paying it back. And not a single one has paid back a penny. $3 million. If Muslims were more trustworthy, perhaps we'd have more scholarships around. But the Muslims think that because it's a Muslim source, they don't have to pay up like they do to non-Muslim sources, and they don't bother paying. So no wonder our sources of scholarships have begun to dry up. Not begun, they have dried up to a large extent. What I suggest that we can do at this juncture in time is to try to find out what monies are available in the, in, the, in the larger society that Muslims could have access to if they knew about. And we should develop a data bank on that because there's a lot of money out there that we just don't know about. We just have to go and search for it. Thank and you very I much for your participation. We have a few announcements by our program chairman, Ali Ramadan. Okay, uh, inshallah, because we have started late and we are sorry for that again, 
uh, we will try to make up for the next session. And uh, you have now uh, a coffee break for instead of half an hour, we'll make it for 15 minutes. And we will try to be here and we'll start, inshallah, on 11.10 exactly. Jazakum Allah khair wa barakallahu bikum. That concludes this session of the Muslim Americans Political Awareness Conference. For more information about the issues discussed here, you may write to the Islamic Society of North America. The address is 11180 West Washington Street, Indianapolis, Indiana, 46231.